Hey, faithful listener, thanks for tuning in to the P40 Ministries daily podcast. This podcast is dedicated to helping you grow spiritually so you can grow personally. Let's grow together by building a consistent Bible reading routine. This is Jen, your host, and today we will be discussing the book of Exodus. Happy Labor Day, friends and faithful listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in on your probable day off. Maybe not everybody has a day off, but hopefully most of you guys do and that you're going to be enjoying your family today with some picnics or cookouts or barbecues or whatever you do on Labor Day. But nonetheless, thank you for tuning in to the podcast on your day off. So that's very appreciated. And I have some good news. I'm finally in my new house. <laughs> so I'm very excited about the the new house and the new setup I have for my podcast. And so thankful to everybody who prayed for us during this entire thing, for people who lent us boxes, and um, for people who helped us out as well. So thank you to everybody who prayed or helped out during the move. I am very, very appreciative. And so is my husband. But today we are going to be discussing Exodus chapter 21 verses 12 through 21 out of the WEB version of the Bible today. But of course, you are always free to read out of whatever version you usually read out of. And uh, make sure to grab that cup of coffee or that hot dog off the grill (laughs) that you are uh, grilling up today. And let's go ahead and jump right in. One who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. But not if it is unintentional, but God allows it to happen. Then I will appoint you to a place where he shall flee. If a man schemes and comes presumptuously on his neighbor to kill him, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. Anyone who attacks his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Anyone who kidnaps someone and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Anyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. If men quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist and he doesn't die but is confined to bed, if he rises again and walks around with his staff, then he who struck him shall be cleared. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall provide for his healing until he is thoroughly healed. If a man strikes his servant or his maid with a rod, and he dies under his hand, the man shall surely be punished, notwithstanding. If his servant gets up after a day or two, he shall not be punished, for the servant is his property. I think this is another one where people kind of look at it and don't see the full picture of what God is saying here and kind of just think God is mean without really uh, discussing it or taking a look at it in depth. So let's take a look at this here. So it starts off by talking about uh, a premeditated murder of another person in verse 12. So it says that someone who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. So anybody who premeditates a murder, so in other words, schemes about it in his own home, is figuring out how to kill somebody or murder somebody. God says that if that person goes out and kills somebody, then that person will definitely be put to death by and don't forget this is all under the judicial system god puts a court system in place very very early on like this was way beyond its time period there was no court systems in place back then if there was any kind of court system it was probably under the rule of a king and the king had the final say in everything we see that in egypt with that pharaoh who was regarded as a god and whatever he said went. He did. He had full 100% power of Egypt. That was the kind of court system that was put in place, which was a man-made court system and extremely flawed because we see that uh, we see what the Israelites were coming out of in Egypt, the harsh torture and the slavery of an entire people and even genocide of the Israelite people. So that was the kind of court system that the ancient world had back then. But God is putting a brand new court system in place where there's a judicial system and anything that um, the elders of that court don't know how to judge on, they would go to God at that point or go to Moses who would talk to God and then God would tell them what to do, which we do see uh, later on. 
which is some of the stuff that happens. But so God is putting out laws so that the people aren't just basically in the Wild West doing whatever they want to whoever they want, because God does not like murder of another human being. We see that any time that God orders the death of a person, it is when they have committed a terrible crime. That is basically the only time God ever commands the death of another person. So God, (laughs) and I'm getting a little uh, controversial here, God actually agrees with capital punishment because he puts capital punishment in place here very early on for people who have um, done horrible wrongs to other people. And moving on, I really like how God often says the word neighbor all throughout uh, the law. For example, here in verse 14, it says that if a man schemes and comes presumptuously on his neighbor to kill him, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. So God uses the word neighbor and he's making the Israelites look at each other as if they are neighbors or even brothers and sisters. Because since God is the father of the Israelite nation, they are all his sons and daughters, which means in a sense, they are all kind of related. So God uses the word neighbor to say, look, don't be killing each other off. Don't do that. Don't murder each other. It is wrong. And God was against murder of innocent people from the very, very, very beginning of time with Cain and Abel. When Cain killed his brother for an absolutely no good reason other than jealousy. And God was extremely upset with it at that time in history. And so God is against the murder of innocent people. So right here, he's putting this law in place. And he had already said this law it from the sky to the entire congregation of Israel who chose not to hear his voice. They didn't want to hear it. But God said to them, thou shalt not kill. It was one of the Ten Commandments. So God had already told this to the people, but now to Moses privately, he is telling this as well, which is another funny thing because Moses was in fact a murderer. <laughs> he killed somebody. And we see God taking mercies for people who killed other people. Like, look at David, for example. David was a man who was considered to be after God's own heart, is what they say about him in the Bible. And yet, he did exactly what it says here, God says not to do. He did exactly that. He premeditated a murder. David was a murderer. Yet, God showed mercy on David. And God shows mercy on murderers several times throughout the Bible. And God is saying this to Moses, who did, in fact, kill somebody. So, yes, even though God is very just, he is also very loving and very merciful as well. So it says that um, in verse 13, if a person accidentally kills another person unintentionally, so it's a complete accident, then that person should be guiltless in a sense because it was an accident. The person did not mean to hurt a person in that way. I I think it's interesting here that God says in verse 13, but if it is not intentional and God allows it to happen, then I will appoint you to a place where this person shall flee. There's something really comforting to me about that verse that God can see and he knows every single thing that happens to everybody. And uh, just the fact that God, you know, even though Accidental deaths are terrible, and they do, in fact, happen, unfortunately, too often. God is in control of all of them, and he sees them. And I know that that's not always the easy answer, because there's many people out there who have lost their husbands or their wives or their children to terrible circumstances. And the one thing that I really like that I've heard before is that the reason God is not shocked by death is because he understands the reality of life after death. So he is in control of all situations. So like I said, that verse there is just a very comforting verse that even God is in control of accidental deaths. And uh, he sometimes allows them to happen for reasons that we may not understand, but that God certainly knows about. So it says here that the person that caused the accidental death is actually allowed to flee into a city and that God was going to give them a city that they could run to. 
But the reason God gives them a place to flee, which we do find out later on, we'll talk way more about that in the future. God gives like a whole thing about that. The reason God get, puts that in place is because if somebody wants to take revenge on that person, so say somebody's brother accidentally died by the hands of this individual, someone in that brother's family might want to take revenge against the person who accidentally killed the brother. So God gives them a safe place to go until the court can hear out this, uh, this problem. God does that to protect that individual and also to kind of protect the person who wants to take revenge by not allowing them to kill an innocent person. Anyway, to move on, God gives that person a place to go to if they accidentally kill somebody. But if that person chose to kill this person, it was premeditated, it was uh, something that should never have been done, then that person should be killed by uh, the court system. And it says that uh, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. So it doesn't matter if this person confessed their sins through the sacrifice of an animal at the altar. That person should still be killed for their crimes because they killed another human being. So God is saying that this person might try to just confess their sins through sacrifice, but it doesn't matter. Even though even though God probably would forgive that person's sins, there are still consequences to a person's sin. And the judges should not be fooled that this, this person is asking for forgiveness and all this, but he should be for his crimes punished, is what God is saying. So then in verse 15, God holds young people to a much higher standard, and also in verse 18. So it says that anyone who or I'm sorry, in verse 15, it says, anyone who attacks his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. This could be an adult child or this could be a teenage child. Anybody who aggressively attacks their parents should be put to death. Now, why would God put this in place? Because older people, naturally, as we get older, we get weaker. And older people are much more vulnerable because they are weaker. They cannot defend themselves as well as a young man or a young woman could. A younger person going around attacking older people, it's unthinkable. It's its bad. And we hear about this. We hear about this in the news. We hear about uh, these, these people going around and attacking elderly people on the streets because elderly people are vulnerable. And so God is protecting older people and holding young people to a high standard that they should not be attacking their parents. And I think that God is putting a higher standard on young people because young people are the future. When God puts stronger rules on younger people, it is because that he is our father. I said that earlier. And a father is going to be harsher with a younger person to show them this is how you need to live once you get older and teach your kids to do this as well. So this is just God putting a stronger law on young people so that they're just not blazingly going around attacking vulnerable people or attacking their parents, which God puts those parents in that child's life or that uh, adult child's life. So it's important that a person doesn't go around attacking their parents if they hold a grudge against their parents or anything like that. The parents are going to be left up to God. It says in the Bible that vengeance is mine. And so if you have very flawed parents, I think it is important to let God deal with your parents. Because God, it, it says in the Bible, God does not like when we go out on a personal vendetta and hurt people. It's wrong. It says that God will bring vengeance on those people for us. So a child should not be attacking their parents if they have a personal grudge against their parents because it is up to God to deal with those parents in the way that God will deal with them. And God will deal with them. God will deal with parents who have abused their children and who have hurt them. It is not up for the children at that point, I believe, to attack their parents. Because once again, God did put those parents in that person's life. And God will deal with those parents the way God will deal with them. And in fact, God says here in verse uh, 17 that even if a person curses their parents, they should be put to death. And I believe it, it depends on the version you read. Some versions say threaten their parents. So I believe this is to the parents' face. I believe that if a child goes 
up to their parents and says that they are going to kill them or they are cursing them in some way. I believe that is what this is talking about. And God says that that is not okay either. So then it to move on, it says here that um, if someone kids, kidnaps a person and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Now, this is talking about uh, man stealing. This is what Gregory Kokel was talking about on Friday. This was absolutely not okay, according to God's law. Man stealing was absolutely horrific. So when we talk about slavery, and we think about it with what happened in the United States, that was wrong because that those people were kidnapped. And so this is that was the kind of slavery God is saying. Absolutely. No, 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 no. Slavery that is mentioned as OK in the law, or I should actually say servanthood, is when a servant sells themselves basically to pay off a debt or because they are very poor. They could sell their services to a master. And at that point, that master would have an employee that they would have to free after seven years. So this wasn't even a permanent thing. Slavery was never supposed to be a permanent thing. And even when God says, um, God actually does mention that uh, thieves should be sold for their uh, thievery. Even they, I believe, were supposed to be released after a certain time period. But I might be wrong about that. But we'll talk more about that later. But um, when a person is sold, usually it's a mutual agreement between two people. Or it's uh, ordered by the court in the case of thievery. So then it says here that if somebody kidnaps him and sells him, that person should be put to death. There is no kidnapping allowed in God's law. Kidnapping should not happen. And so if somebody kidnaps a person to sell them into slavery, that is absolutely wrong. That person should be put to death. And even if the uh, the person is found with um, money, say that they already sold that person and instead they still have all the money, still, it doesn't matter. That person did the deed and they should be put to death. So then it says here in verses uh, 18 and 19 that if a person, two men are fighting, let's say two people are fighting, they get into a fist fight and one guy gets hurt. It says that the person who hurt this person needs to pay for his medical expenses and needs to pay for the loss of this person's time. So if this person, let's say he um, can't work for like two months because he got really hurt and is in the hospital, the person here in this case needs to pay for that person's medical expenses and needs to pay his wage. (laughs) So God is putting precautions in place for two people who are like dueling it out here because inevitably it would probably happen. So God does make um, exceptions for the hardness of hearts. And it says that he does in Matthew. Jesus mentions that God puts precautions in place so that people aren't just blazingly going around and hurting other people. So then it says here that in verse 20, this talks about the hurting of a servant. So it says that if a man strikes his servant or his maid with a rod and he dies under his hand, the man shall surely be punished. So God is saying that this is also manslaughter. This is wrong. So if a maid or a servant gets hurt by the master and dies, then the master does need to be punished. So then it says here that notwithstanding in verse 21 to conclude, if his servant gets up after a day or two, he shall not be punished for the servant is his property. So it never says in the law that a servant is not the property of the master. In fact, it's pretty clear that the servant does in fact belong to the master because the master paid for that servant's services. And this would be a mutual agreement. This is not man stealing. This is a mutual agreement between the servant and the master and the court. This was all extremely organized. And so God is putting precautions once again in place for that servant. Now there may be, and I'm just speculating here, there may be times where a servant would not be working or be doing something wrong or be hurting another person. And at that point, that servant would have to be punished. But God is saying here to the master, if you do punish that servant, You better be careful. You better be careful. And even if you punish him, we're going to talk about this later. It says in verse 26 and 27 that if you accidentally ruin one of their teeth, that slave is supposed to be sent out free. So God is saying to the masters, be 
very careful if you do, in fact, punish your servant. Your servant is a human being. And back then in ancient times, servants or slaves would not have been considered human beings. They would have been considered lowest of the low. So God is saying, your servant is a person. He is somebody who is your employee. So be very, very careful if you do punish a servant so that you firstly don't accidentally hurt them because you'd have to set them free anyway. Or if you accidentally put them to death, you will also be severely punished for hurting your servant who is a human being. I think we read stuff like this and we don't take into account the entire picture of what God was talking about here with servants because we think of them as slavery and God being okay with slavery, but it doesn't say that God is okay with slavery. It says that God is okay with indentured servanthood, which is what a person would do if they are in poverty and need to get themselves out of that situation. A person that has more money could basically own that person for a set amount of years and uh, it would be an employee-employer relationship but a little bit different where the employee kind of does belong to the employer, but not so much that the employer just has full rights over this person. There is many, many precautions in place to protect that servant and to protect that situation so that the servant is not abused by their master and so that the servant is treated like a human being because the the Israelites were in fact slaves in Egypt. And so God is saying, don't do that to other people. You will do it differently. So this was Exodus chapter 21 verses uh, 12 through 21. And this was a harder chapter. I I, I kind of had trouble talking about this one a little bit, um, mainly because there are many things here that we just don't understand because a lot of this stuff doesn't apply to modern day. But like Greg Kokel said, on Friday, we shouldn't be applying it to modern day. We should be applying it to back then because back then things were very, very different. I, I think this stuff is very interesting. And join me on Wednesday. We will be discussing um, some more of this chapter with actually my sister, Jamie, who will be on the podcast um, with me. She's going to be joining in hopefully once a month to co-host a podcast episode with me because I don't get to see my sister very often. And I uh, She enjoys doing the podcast with me, and I love having her on. And this is kind of a chance for us to hang out a little bit. (laughs) So um, so definitely join us on Wednesday. But friends and faith listeners, I want you to have a fantastic Labor Day weekend. Eat lots of hamburgers and lots of hot dogs and lots of barbecue. And uh, make sure that you have a blessed day. Happy listening and God bless.